I'm your host Stelios and the founder and director of the World of Serres. In today's episode, I talk to Dino Ioannidis. Dino is a consummate food fanatic with an Italian mother and a half Greek and half Corsican father. He spent his first years in Italy before moving to the UK. Over the last 30 odd years, he's travelled and eaten all over Italy in people's homes, simple trattorias and the finest restaurants. Dino believes that good quality ingredients in small quantities are what make a perfect meal. I wanted to sit down and talk to Dino because he has his feet in the technology sector. His current role is working for Bizimply, an all-in-one scheduling, time tracking, human resources and shift management software. But he's also firmly implanted into the hospitality industry. So I thought, you know, no time like the present, best of both worlds, let's have a chat. I've followed Dino for years on all social platforms and I think the podcast has just brought us both together. He has also written a great cookbook called Semplice, taking different elements of Italian cooking and exploring their origin and provenance. Dino will explode myths and expound facts surrounding some of the the key ingredients in Italian cooking. There are also a hundred delicious recipes to show you how to put well-sourced ingredients together to make the most amazing, achievable and authentic Italian food possible. Go find Semplice at any fine bookstore. I'll also put a link to it in the show notes. I guess there wasn't any real objective to the whole podcast as such. It's just that me and Dino just wanted to have a chat. And I think we hit on some great topics as Dino is pretty much a library of information when it comes to where food comes from. So for me, it was a bit of an anthropology lesson. As you may have noticed, we have started slotting in these ads at the beginning of the podcast. We will never insert the ads in the middle to break the conversation. We hope that's cool with you. It gives us a chance to highlight and support what we do at Ceres, but what others that support us do too. Being the head honcho at the world of Ceres, I'm probably biased somewhat, but I do get pretty excited about the Ceres Deep Fryer Cleaner. The reason is it was the first product I developed that wasn't a food product. The benefits of a regular fry boil outs are endless. The fact is, cleaner pans give you better oil life, better food quality, better recovery but one of the biggest positives is the fact that you are checking for your pan integrity a lot more often with luck you can find out what problems are coming well before they happen it works on all frying ranges and all commercial fryers think of it like this if the vessel is dirty then how can you fry clean tasting food go one step further how can you add new oil to a dirty fryer can you afford not to have a regular boil out routine Order your Serres deep fryer cleaner today at theworldofserres.com. This podcast has been brought to you in association with industry titans Giovanna Grossi and Amanda Affia of Source Intelligence Mystery Guest Audits. Well known for their commitment to the hospitality sector and support of those working in it. Their business also offers a range of bespoke training programs tailored to your operations individual training needs. Source Intelligence delivers head of department and management geared training days that not only enhance team building across your most senior employees, but also equips them with the tools to motivate and develop their own teams. In addition, they offer one-to-one mentoring style sessions targeted at individuals across your team who would benefit from that extra focus and attention. Their newly built online audit process, which they use for their mystery guest visits, has been designed to give clients an honest, reliable, bespoke and commercially focused report with suggested solutions and advice on the next step to resolve issues, increase profitability and enhance your reputation. Now, who can say no to that? To find out more about their mystery visits or their training sessions, give Giovanna or Amanda a call or visit sourceintelligence.com. We hope you enjoy this episode with Dino as much as I did recording it. Do us a favour and leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps others find us. Dino, welcome to the Sarah's podcast. Stelios, thank you very much for inviting me. It's an honor. Well, the honor is all mine, my friend. I know a little bit about you because for years, even without knowing it to some degree, 
I've always followed you on Twitter, Instagram. There's always been like this weird connection. We've got friends of friends. We've interviewed friends of yours. For those that don't know you, tell us a little bit about Dino Joannidis and what Dino does. My background really is I sort of first 15 years of my life, I I lived in about eight or nine different countries due to my dad's work. He, he worked for Reuters first as a journalist and then he moved into a sort of management and the company changed, became more about financial data for banks. So it, it wasn't just uh, media companies they dealt with. So um, I kind of followed him around, obviously, as his, uh, as his son and you know, lived in different countries. And um, the last posting he had, uh, a civil war broke out, which was Lebanon and... Um, I had to come back to the UK, which was where uh, headquarters was. And uh, they moved the uh, regional headquarters to uh, Bahrain in those days. And there weren't really any schools that were appropriate for me. So I, I went back to my old school in, um, in London and finished my education here. Um, and then went to university, then uh, ended up staying in university for about seven years because I was luckily to do some postgraduate work, um, which was in Paris. So I spent three years in Paris doing field work and so on. But uh, it also was a good place to be to sort of partake in my other passion, which is um, food and beverage and gastronomy generally. So um, I, I, I managed to combine those those two things. And it's kind of been a pattern of my career really where I've managed to combine um, things that I love uh, and do several things at once. Um I think as I've got older, I've focused more and I do less things now. But um, I, I, uh, I basically started working in the technology sector, and that's been the majority of my uh, kind of work and work-related uh, activities. And then um, about 12, 13 years ago, I got involved uh, as an owner or a founder of um, some food and beverages businesses. So the long and the short of it is it, all the things that I did – meant that I built very good relationships with the hospitality sector, whether as a consumer, a supplier of old-fashioned things like produce or wine uh, or software. So um, you kind of get to know all the people in the organizations or the businesses, whether it's an owner, whether it's a chef, patron, a sommelier, uh, you know, an operations director and so on. So, um, I never really thought about it until quite recently that, you know, how did I meet this person? I actually met him wearing this hat. And um, so it's, 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 you just build up this huge network really without ever having planned it, you know. And uh, I'd like to think a lot of the people over the years have become really good friends, you know. Um, and I like to visit their establishments personally and have a meal or catch up with them and so on. And of course, people move around and people that, um, may have started as um, literally as a kitchen porter end up having a little restaurant empire or um, a chain of fish and chip shops or whatever. So it's, it's, it's fascinating. And uh, I know hospitality can be uh, a temporary career for some people. Uh, but, you know, I think over the years, I think you probably agree with me. And we can see now, you know, in, this, in these tough times that it's such a significant sector in the UK. And because it's been affected, you know, people can see, you know, how important it is in terms of certainly of employment and um, contribution to GDP, you know. So, uh, and, and really, there's been a massive change in, in Britain, you know, in terms of people's propensity to go out for a meal. You know, in the 60s or 70s, that wasn't the case. They are spoilt for choice. Choice is probably the highest in any country in Europe. I mean, uh, the diversity in choice is, is, I don't think anybody would argue, is, is, is huge in the, in the whole of the UK. You know, you can go pretty much anywhere and find that choice and diversity, which you, you wouldn't find in a small provincial town in France or even, even in Spain. I think it's fair to say that the UK has become an eat-out nation. I was chatting to someone yesterday and we were saying how it may not look like it, but it is definitely a food capital of Europe, if not the world. I think that UK and consumers eat out a lot in the UK. And I think COVID showed that. Like if you if you saw all of a sudden how much food was going into food service, just all of a sudden stop. And then all of a sudden, 
everyone had to then repurpose it, repackage it for it to then go through the retail channels. I think that was a big shock to the system. I think people didn't realize, even consumers, I don't think they realize how much they eat out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, yeah, you get these surveys, you know, how many times do you eat out on takeaways and stuff like that? And, and most people, when you add it up, it's, you know, it's 30 or 40% of your meals. It might just be, you know, picking up fish and chips on the way home. It might be um, ordering a takeaway because you haven't had time to, to get anything during the day. or But yeah, I mean, that's that, that, that kind of typical numbers really, aren't they, for, for a lot of people? I think it could be pretty much higher than 40% as well. I think sometimes we all do this thing where we either don't know how much we do it or we don't want to know how much we do it. And I think we all want to make out that we all sit around the table as a family and eat. But actually, we not everyone does that. And I think, you know, I, I chat to a lot of, fish and chip shops as I do and I talk to a lot of restaurant owners and pubs if you talk to the average chip shop owner they'll say to you that they might see the same customer two three times a week it's not hard to envisage that that customer also eats pizza or Chinese food or Indian food or maybe treats himself to a Sunday roast on a Sunday would they not go to Greg's at lunch if you just look at the eat out home market it's, it's pretty significant I'd say and I think COVID has really shined a light on that so w- what I'd probably be interested in seeing is does that go back to square one again do people carry on as they were or do they carry on cooking at home? Did they enjoy it? Were they good at it? That's yeah, a very interesting question. I, I, I'm i speaking to some sort of um, – or some of the bigger players who have had a, had a business that was mainly focused on the sort of lunchtime trade in, in um, uh, kind of office-centric uh, areas, like, you know, centre center of towns and so on, um, and had – had expanded into suburbs and you know, they, they've had a bit of a reversal. So they so um, I, I'll give you an example. So uh, Pret a Manger, um, I believe that their uh, Fulham Road um, uh, shop um, started doing numbers way in excess of, you know, the one that's just off Regent Street. So that gives you a, kind of an, an idea. So, so I guess people now are looking again at their estate and where it should be and so on. So that, that, um, and a lot of it, you know, anecdotally, I mean, I haven't seen any studies or anything, but um, people that were working from home still, you know, popped out and went, you know, instead of going to Pret, which is a, you know, um, very successful at that lunchtime trade business in, in somewhere like central London, um, when they were going, going to the nearest one um, just to get out of the house and get a break and, effectively have a similar lunch break but instead of having it in an office they were having it at home you know they they, they weren't just going into the kitchen and rustling up a, a meal you know because they uh, they want they still want the convenience and maybe get a bit of fresh air as well so i think i think that uh, that's been one of the interesting things about operators that have this estate which is let's say uh, varied i guess you know and um and it, it'll be interesting to see what they do going forward you know in terms of their new sites and, and so on in, 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 in the new environment. One thing that I wanted to ask you when I was sort of just chatting and making some notes, as you know, I've been annoying you the last few days with WhatsApp messages. <laughs> You're a blend of Greek, Italian and Corsican. You have a blend of all the short temper genes. How does that manifest itself in passion? Like, is that does that help you with food? Does it help you with the tech business? Like, and how has that sort of helped you over the years? Would you say? I don't think I fall into those sort of. Um, and I, I think you're right about the characterization of those. Um, uh, you know, Greece can be quite fiery. Italians are as well. Um, Corsicans are notorious <laughs> for you know you say the wrong thing or look at someone the wrong way. You know, but. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I'm maybe it's because I, I lived in different countries and so on. I, I, I don't have those characteristics. I'm generally considered to be quite uh, calm, um, and um, I, you know, I've, I've lost my temper usually in things like, you know, playing squash or something like that, rather than, you know, in business or you know, dealing with colleagues or anything like that. So um, I think anybody that's worked with me would say I'm fairly level-headed and calm and, and, and so on. So, um, uh, yeah, but the passion thing is a very interesting one because, I, you know, I do get very passionate about certain things, you know, like, you know, I'm very passionate about ingredients and I, I um, you know, I cook myself and I you know, I love talking to chefs and about sourcing. And, and so I'm, I've always been, um, you know, I picked that up quite young. It was something I got from my dad who was, was the same, you know, and, told me some truths, you know, at an early age about 
you know, anywhere in the world you'll find something good or, you know, you say, look out for it. It's not going to come and smack you in the face, you know. So I've always done research and, you know, I, I, I never go to places and think, right, you know, what am I going to do now or something like that. I've usually done some back. You know, so if I was to go to, um, let's say, you know, where your, where your family's from, a specific part of Cyprus, I would definitely do some research and that's either the internet or, you know, talk to people that have been there. Where do you recommend? People I trust. Someone like Andy Haler that we we talked about, you know, um, the chances are he's been to that country, and and um, you know you save a lot of time. So if you find these trusted pallets, then they they can save you um, uh, a lot of time. And and I do get myself, I get a lot of uh, people saying I'm going so to this place, and would you know um, you know where would you go if you I'm, I'm here for a day, you know what are the two places I need to go to and that. So um, it's a it's a kind of an exchange really of information, and I think um, you know word of mouth, of course, has been amplified by the internet, but it's it's still the best source, especially for food and beverage. I think you know you, um, uh, I mean, like you know, you we were talking about coffee as well earlier on, and um, I was introduced to to Amir by a mutual friend, and um, he just said, I think you'll get on, so. He said to me, do you like cigars? I said, yeah, I smoke the, the occasional cigar. So we met in a, in a walk-in humidor, and he introduced me to his coffee while whilst we smoked an outstanding cigar. And it was the best two and a half hours I'd, I'd spent for a long time, you know. And um, I came out with, uh, you know, increased knowledge on something that I liked. And, um, you know, we've become good friends, you know. So these are, these are great. I call them gastronomic uh, rendezvous you know which are which are great you know so um, i really enjoyed doing the podcast with him here i think he's a really interesting guy and he knows a lot about coffee which again you know i think it's nice to see people that really appreciate and understand their craft he, he's really tried to understand everything and where he didn't know would just say oh, i don't really know but what, what i think what was clever about that is that he he, he adopted a, a process which um i'm um a great fan of which is used by for like Bizimply, for instance, which is the software company I'm involved with, uh, and it's 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 solving a problem for the yeah you know, the, the the restaurant business. So it it you know they they want to offer the best possible coffee, but they need to have the tools to do it. So that's what he's done in a way, you know. So he you know he he can prove that he has the best coffee, but he's also got a solution for them to to provide consistent coffee to the guests, which is a very difficult thing in in especially in a fine dining restaurant because you often don't have the room or you can't have a dedicated barista, you know, and spend all that equipment and that. So, so a lot of them don't, aren't able to offer the same quality of coffee as say um, a good specialty coffee um, shop, you know, and um, you know, so it's, 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 it's solving uh, a problem as well as delivering um, an outstanding premium product, you know, which is, uh, which is, which is, which is great. Before we get on to Bizimply, one thing I wanted to ask you is like, what motivates someone to write a cookbook? You're obviously very skilled. You're involved with the Guild of Food Writers. Is that Yeah, right? I'm a member. I'm a member of the Guild. Yeah, so to, to, be, to become a member, you just have to have written about food, basically. It's, uh, and, and you, and you apply and you, someone says he's all right. And, you know, you get accepted or you don't, but uh, it's uh, it's the old, it's one it's a very old guild and it's it, it's a who's who of great food writers. You know, from Nigella Lawson to uh, you name most of them are there. I mean, you know, it's um, and it's it's always nice to sort of meet them occasionally. And um, uh, but uh, to be perfectly honest, I never had any aspirations to write um, a food book. It's purely by chance. Often, I think it happens in many people's lives. A very good friend of mine, Simon Majumda, who used to work in publishing, um, he had a sort of, uh, I hope he doesn't mind me saying, a kind of a midlife crisis and decided to pack it in. But he, he went for something that he knew and he decided to become a food writer himself. And he got a, he got a book deal to, to write a book where he basically traveled all, all around the world and wrote about it. It's called Eat My Globe. And that was his first book. And it was very successful. Um, in the process of doing that book, he met uh, a young lady who's now his wife and they live in uh, LA. He's got an agent and uh, he's on the food network on various shows. Um, he's very well, whenever I meet him in LA, we, we go for a walk, people come up to him in the street, you know, we go to restaurants and 
I can see people nervously um, um, kind of um, uh, whispering and so on. And then suddenly all these plates appear with, you know, extra dishes and say, I'll try this, what do you think? And all that. So he's become quite well known, and especially on that side of the Atlantic. And he's written three or four books, I think, you know. And um, anyway, he introduced me to a former colleague of his, a guy called uh, Trevor Dolby, who has actually worked on some of the best known cookbooks, if you like, or, or including uh, White Heat, which you've probably heard of, which many chefs have on their shelves. You know, it's inspired many chefs. You know, it was Marco Pierre's White, white um, book, which was very different because they, they used a famous uh, photographer who, who was better known for doing uh, rock stars and, and fashion and that. And um, the book is still, you know, very fresh today. I mean, it was, uh, I think it was... Uh, 1980s, early 80s. Anyway, he worked on a number of books I knew and so on. And he said, yeah, you guys should meet for lunch and, you know, um, you will, uh, you'll get on and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I went just, I don't know, any friend of Simon's, whatever. And we had a great lunch. And um, I think the restaurant was actually uh, 10 Greek Street, bizarrely. Um, and we, uh, we got on really well. And, you know, and, and I thought, oh, nice guy. I'm sure we'll meet again. And, at the end of the meal, he said, um, I want you to write a book. And I said, what about? He said, everything we've been talking about. And I said, well, for some reason, we ended up talking a lot about Italian food. And he said, exactly. I like. I want you to write a book. And I said, well, I would only write a book if I could do it my way. And he said, absolutely, you'll do it your way. And I'd love to work with you on that. And that was it. Within a month, I had a contract from Penguin Random House. And I felt a bit guilty about it because I have had lots of friends who were – really wanted to write cookbooks and they were sending their um, ideas and, and uh, sort of manuscripts or summaries and so on. And, you know, it's, it's yeah, I, 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 it was purely by, by chance and maybe the timing was good because you know, nothing different had been really written in that field and so on. So um, I wanted to do it in a slightly different way. And um, it, it, it coincided around the period that my dad died as well. So it was a great cathartic exercise because it was, it was hard work to do that whilst working as well. So I'd often start working at 10 o'clock at night and work till say four o'clock in the morning, get a few hours. But it, 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 it I think that helped me actually get it done because, you know, you set yourself deadlines and stuff like that. But it was, um, the sad thing was that my dad never saw the book, but, um, uh, and he was my inspiration for that, you know, sort of gastro- gastronomy side of, uh, my persona, if you like. And, um, yeah, so I think it was, it just had to be done. You know, if you, you have that opportunity, you'd be foolish not to, to do it. I mean, there, there are people who get the opportunity and can never actually finish the book. Yeah. I'm very, I'm very proud of it. I, I've had, I've heard good things about it and, and I still, um, get messages from people and, uh, it's, it's, it's done very well in, um, places where, you know, the Italian diaspora went, you know, so it did very well in Australia where there's a lot of Italians. Uh, in Latin America and, and, and the US, of course, you know, because I, I covered that subject of how Italian food traveled with the immigrants. You know, it's a very interesting subject. It changes, obviously, with um, with travel and, and, and location and ingredients and, and stuff like that. So um, um, if you if you want a good uh, insight into Italian American food, watch The Sopranos. Because there's lots, there's lots of scenes of dishes which are very kind of not only Amer- Italian American, but New Jersey Italian American food, you know, stuff like you you only see there. And you know, Italians in Italy would just put their hands up in horror and at some of those dishes. So, how Italian is Italian food? Well, the thing about Italy, Italy is a very young country, and as I say in my book, that you know, there's no such thing as cuisines. You know, really, uh, I think that I've had this argument with lots of friends of mine. You know, but you can make a case for the French because they're actually not unexpected for them. They they, they codified it. So the French are responsible for a lot of things, including codifying sources and 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 and, and lots of aspects of, of cooking. And they they also had a huge influence on the organisation of restaurants. I mean, you you've only got to go into a restaurant and listen to the sound of a kitchen brigade. You know, we chef and the, the, their job titles and organisation and so on. And you know, you go and talk to a guy like John Williams at the Ritz, and you know, he you know that that is the use case for a classic French kitchen. Of course, there's there's been there's been changes in that, but the, but the language of the kitchen is is, is, is French. So you, you can make a case for the, there being like a French cuisine, if you like, you know. But so in terms of Italy, and you could probably say the same about China. You're probably going to get a lot of people sending emails about this. But 
in Italy, it's more of a collection of regional cooking. Some of it is crossed over, you know, something like pesto has gone nationwide, even though it's historically from Liguria. And, um, and then there's, there's also the fact that Italy was invaded by lots of different people. So the so-called barbarians were in fact Germanic tribes and they brought the, the technique or the technology of curing meat. So without these barbarians, you know, the Germanic tribes, you wouldn't have had Parma ham, culatello, salami, because they brought that knowledge. So, you know, we all look at Italy and say, oh, they've got all these great cured meats. But without the, the, the barbarians, you know, and then you look at something like uh, Botarga in Sardinia, which, you know, you find in in, in the Greek world as uh, Avgotarago, even in Egypt and places like that. So this is, it's basically made with grey mullet roe. And that was the Phoenicians basically started trading that and they took it to Sardinia. Uh, and you know those those Phoenician city states are basically in modern day Lebanon and Syria. They used to trade. The the whole sort of origin and movement of food is, a, is another fascinating. So food anthropology is fascinating. I mean, you know, like so you know, whereas Neapolitans would be say we invented pizza. Well, in fact, that kind of unleveled bread, you know, actually came from places like you know modern day Iraq and India. Um, you know, there's myths like, uh, and that's one of the things I wanted to do in my book. You know, Marco Polo. Did, bringing pasta back from China is nonsense, you know, because uh, before he even sailed, there's records of pasta already existing in, in Genoa, you know. It doesn't mean that the Chinese or what is now mainland China was not where a mixture of flour and water created a kind of pasta, but it doesn't mean that the, the one that came into what is modern-day Italy came from there, you know. In fact, it came from North Africa. So if you go, you can trace it. If you go to Sicily, you'll find part of the island they eat couscous and as you know couscous is basically a, a pasta it's a, it's 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 wheat and water and durum wheat and water and, and and so on so it's all it's all the, the the problem with food is it leads to food nationalism you know so if you want to wind people up you say something like actually you know roast beef and yorkshire pudding actually came from france you know you go nuts <laughs> one of my mates is from greece he lives over here born over here but i always make fun of him and say that everything's from cyprus Always. I, that's all I do. Like whenever he says, oh, Greece invented this or Italy invented that or whatever, I'll always say, no, Cyprus invented it. And it's just a bit of a laughing joke. Like all those things can be true at the same time. The Italians could have been eating pasta when the Chinese were eating noodles at exactly the same time. It doesn't have to be one over the other. And I think you're right. It does lead back to this food nationalism. Italians, even themselves, they would argue that, you know, I, I had an Italian guy that I'm still friends with. He used to work for us. And I think his family is from near Rome, maybe. I can't remember. Or is it? No, it's not. No, it's not. Um, from near Sorrento, essentially. I remember we went out for something to eat. And he was like, oh, I don't like cream. I don't like butter. I don't like any of this in my food. And I was like, why? He goes, that's a northern Italian thing. And I was like, yeah, but we're at a curry house. <laughs> uh, he'd literally, he, he'd made it explicit that all of his eating habits, not just Italian food, he'd literally, all of his eating habits, he didn't have butter on anything, hated brioche bread, anything like that. Honestly, it was a, it was a surprise how he ate. But yeah, he, he him, he just said to me when he was growing up, his dad would always say, that's not Italian food. That's northern Italian food, you know. You know, he'd never have balsamic vinegar on his food. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. The reality is that, you know, the, the, the dishes that we know today, most of them actually came from cities. You can tell from the name, you know, and there's a bit of a myth about this cucina povera, you know, like peasants' food and, and so on. If you knew what peasants ate, you know, and, and at the time of, you know, kind of Italian unification and that, you wouldn't, you wouldn't touch it with a barge pole, you know. So food came from cities and then transport spread the food, you know. So, you know, you, there's so many dishes named after a place, you know, um, or, or, or or made in the way of that place, you know, that, and, 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 and so on. So there's 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 another great book, actually, that, um, called Delizia, written by John Dickey, who's a, a historian at UCL. And um, <clears throat> he's, he's, he's also written the, 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 one of the best books on the mafia and on Masons. But his Delizia is the history of it. Italian through food and it's it's a really good read you can get it in paperback and it explains a lot of this and he's you know he obviously knows a lot of the Italian academics and so on and it's um I strongly re recommend it for the sort of historical context he does a lot of myth busting you know showing that these things are just uh and a lot you know and a lot of this is done by you know food companies marketing as well you know they, they create this idea uh, um because it helps promote their products you know and um just one of those things isn't it i mean just like here, you know, the Plowman's Lunch is not some sort of English peasant dish. It was created by the Cheese Marketing Board, you know. So uh, I remember talking to an American chap and he said, do all farmers and 
farm hands eat plowmen's lunches, you know, in, in, in England? And I said, uh, probably not because it's, it's, it's great. It's a marketing thing, you know, but and as, as much as I like a plowman's lunch, I'm, it's just, it's not that, it's not that old. It's quite a recent thing, you know, and uh, in terms of Greek food, I mean, it's the same with um, Greek salad. Greek salad is, uh, is not something that you can trace to the Ottomans or anything like that. It's uh, sort of sprung up. It's, it's quite a modern thing, really. And again, I like it very much, but it's um, it's not really um, a historic dish, you know. So. You know, the good thing with a Greek salad is that if you're in Greece or Cyprus and you have a Greek salad, it's really good, you know. But if you're in Nice and you have a Niçois salad, I found it to be shockingly poor. And I think, and I don't know why, I wonder if it's going back to what you were saying about how the fact that it's probably not got anything to do with the history of the place. It's just they've, they've picked up on it and now they sell it. One thing that's intrigued me a lot, and you mentioned it on Twitter the other week, uh, so like uh, proof of origin of where food comes from, essentially. I can't remember the exact terminology, but it's, protect it's essentially a European protective measure to protect foods. Going back, as you said, about all the history of food and how much that it's sort of, food has changed over the years you know i'm from cypriot origin and the biggest argument at the moment in cyprus is can they get a protection order this pdo to protect halloumi the cypriots can't even agree on it the cypriots argue whether it's made out of lamb's milk sheep's milk ewes milk cow's milk and then on top of that, if you add the wider discussion, you've then got the Turks that say, no, it's Helim. And then you've got the Lebanese that say it's Helum. All of those people lay claim to that cheese. And it is more likely a Middle Eastern cheese, if we're honest, because they were controlling Cyprus back then anyway. It goes the same with Gruyere and Graviera. Obviously, you've got Parmesan and Gefalodiri as well. There's so many cheeses there. And and I think some of those the Greeks have copied. <laughs> but But I think how can someone lay claim and say, hey, you don't make that now? Is it all just a protective sales mechanism? Well, I think I think it's more about the name. I mean, it's 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 a way of protecting intellectual property. So it has to be made in a certain defined place. So some products actually have microclimates involved, like, you know, Parma ham, there was wind, certain parts of Parma. And I think people realize it's a way of creating value and protection of your uh, uh, of your product. I mean, like the Danes were, were notorious for producing Danish feta, Danish salami. These are not indigenous products of uh, Denmark uh, in the way that the Japanese got into consumer electronics and the Koreans got into cars. And, you know, you can do those things with, uh, say, cars, but you can't copy 100% and, um, you know, a Ford and, say, call it Kia, let's say, uh, without there being some kind of legal issue. So I think that it, it's certainly a valuable thing for it, it, there's a lot of PDO products in, in Britain. I mean, you know, uh, Stilton is one, you know, which was, you know, so Stilton is very closely defined to certain parts of uh, Leicestershire, Nottinghamshire, and I believe spreads into, is it Derbyshire? I'm not sure. But anyway, but Stilton um, actually made a mistake in the, uh, when they did their paperwork and they didn't allow for unpasteurized cheese. So all Stilton has to be pasteurized now. And people who are real cheese lovers prefer unpasteurized cheese. You know, there's a great, Neil's Yard is a great dairy. You know, they, they got behind a producer and they, they have a cheese called, they can't call it Stilton because of the, which is called Stilterton. And it's, it's really the real Stilton because it's made when unpasteurized and they actually sell it at a premium, but it doesn't have PDO because it doesn't, can do that, and then it's, you find the same thing in certain regions where producers decide to go over and above that and do their own thing, and they're so powerful because they're well known and liked. They've built their sort of brand, if you like, outside of the PDO. So you can find these uh, these products that are made in that region and and might be better even, you know. So uh, it's it's very common with wine as well. People say, "Look, I don't want to do this combination of grapes and all this stuff, and I'm going to do it this way." And, uh, but their reputation is such that they they carry on and they're great business. There's lots of examples of that in Rioja, in Bordeaux, in Burgundy, uh, you know, all over the place. Uh, in Crete, you know, so, all sorts of things. So. so the PDO, like you say, it's just there to protect IP. But I wonder if there's a better way to do it. I do I do think sometimes, like you know, if you look at the PDO situation with Cyprus and Halloumi. What if they just say Cypriot halloumi? That also allows for then a Turkish halim. Well, the reality is that it's good business for lawyers and, and all that sort of stuff. But it, as a consumer, you've got to let your palate decide, you know. So there, there's a guy actually making very good halloumi here in London. Um, and there's another outfit doing um, burrata and mozzarella, right? Uh, there's Jody Schechter making buffalo products, you know, on his estate. You know, he's, he's, he's built a great business uh, an organic business and he's he's got a huge herd of buffalo and he's doing buffalo ice cream buffalo mozzarella buffalo meat you know and you know he's he's built that over the years and they're good products you know you know obviously there, there are certain things where 
you know, growing bananas here is not really going to be easy. It's hard to really grow good tomatoes here at the moment. But you know, climate change is actually impacting. I mean, like look at the look at the wine industry in the UK. I mean, it's it's unbelievable now. I mean, the quality of the quality of sparkling wines is outstanding, and now still wines are beginning to to come to the fore. You know, so and that's partly driven by um, you know, young people. You know, setting themselves very high benchmarks, but also climate change because um, you can actually make red wine here. It's becoming more and more important, and uh, and it's winning prizes. And some of the English sparkling wines are are, are, are winning competitions against uh, the best from Champagne. I think if you can match, I think, and and that just shows that if you can match great growing practices with weather that suits that that crop, and then great British sort of food practices and food manufacture practices or drink manufacture practices, because you know we've got a very high standard in this country. I think if you pair all those things together, it, it could be world class. Yeah, it is. I mean, there's there's great charcuterie here now. Um, you know, over the last twenty years, and and why shouldn't there be? Because the once you've got the techniques, there's very very good meat available in these islands. You know, so uh, there's some some outstanding stuff. You know, and um, what's actually pleased me the most is that you know young people are, are going into these artisan businesses, and they're not saying right, we're going to you know just get by, and that they're setting very high benchmarks. You know, and they they say we want to make something that's as good as I'll send you the details of that halloumi guy. I mean, you you taste it for yourself. It's it's a great product. Which is it? Which one is it? Is it the guy that makes fettle? I can't remember. Just off the top of my head, I've just forgotten his name. But he's um, he's uh, he's half Cypriot, by the way, and he he decided to, he was doing something completely different, and he he uses obviously milks from from these islands, you know. So it's it's always going to be a bit different to, to what you get in, in Cyprus and Turkey and Lebanon and Syria and places like that. But it's a great product. The milk is very good in this country. There's there's an abundance of milk. And, and milk has been a difficult business for people to get into. A lot of farmers have diversified into cheese. And that's why you know there's probably more varieties of cheese now in, in, in Britain than uh, more famous European countries now. It's, uh, uh, it's unbelievable. And some you know, outstanding cheeses. And the, this is a whole new generation of people that became cheesemakers, you know, that... Uh, some of them were um, doing completely different jobs, you know. A friend of mine came on the podcast. She was one of the early sort of guests on the podcast. And her name is Razan Alsus. Came over with a little grant, ended up in near Huddersfield and started making halloumi. And then she's literally using Yorkshire milk from a farm down the road. And now she's started doing milk from goats and sheep. And again, all, all Yorkshire. She was saying to me, she feels that her cow's milk halloumi, this was surely made cow's milk at the time, halloumi. She feels that it was better than the Cypriot cow's milk halloumi. And I said, so why is that? And she made a very good point because there's hardly any cows in Cyprus. So they're bringing in, you know, dehydrated cow's milk from wherever, and then they make it in Cyprus. And and to be fair, I think if we're on about the same person who makes halloumi down south, um, he said exactly the same thing. You know, people that say, oh, but Cypriot halloumi is the best. And he said that might be the case if you're getting sheep or ewes milk halloumi, but it's not the case if you're getting cow's milk. And to be fair, British cow milk is it's very good. Well, this is a very um, pastures in this country. Are, you know, very you just have to fly over and see how green you know the green and pleasant land. I mean, you know, it's uh, the milk should be good. You know, um, for, uh, for for obvious reasons. You know, so I was visiting uh, a friend of mine who's involved at, uh, with a company called Harvey and Brockless. They supply uh, lots of pubs and restaurants around the country, but also food service and so on. And um, he showed me he had he just had something like forty pallets of halloumi, which, which was going to a very famous um, chain restaurant in, in in the UK. And I said, "What's that? Like, what, is that for a month?" I said, "He said, no, that's that's for the, this week." I was like, "Wow!" <laughs> it was just an, you know an amazing. And they've got like two things on their menu, which has got halloumi in it. You know, so I do think that's where it, it, I'll just say it, if it's Nando's then that is where most people's first experience with halloumi is, you know, and it isn't in Cyprus. And maybe it is for people of my generation up to yours. You know, I think I'm not trying to make a big difference there, but I think for most people eating halloumi was usually on holiday. And then they'd go around the supermarket and think, oh, well, I didn't see that. Oh, let's grab a bit of that. And then they overcook it and it's like rubber. Whereas whereas now, I think I think now they, they, you can get halloumi everywhere. It's not strange when you see it on the menu. I, you know, even I was in a just a normal Tesco the other day and there was six different types of halloumi on the shelf. Yeah, but think about, think about kids, you know, who love Nando's and stuff like that. I mean, a lot of them don't like cheese at a certain age, you know. And then, but So if their introduction to cheese is halloumi, there's more chance of them getting into cheese than, say, if you give them stinking bishop... Uh, Munster or Camembert, you know, they'll they, because 
they'll smell it and the smell will put them off, even though they're not actually strong cheeses, but the smell is very strong. Halloumi is not a strong smell. I mean, it's almost odorless, you know, and then when it's cooked, it's different. It's about texture. It's about, you know, I, I find very few people who don't like halloumi. I think the only people that don't like halloumi is when they've had it and it was overcooked and it went a bit rubber. But I think that's also the same for squid. I think squid's the... the Squid's like the seafood equivalent of halloumi, I think. it's it, To eat squid, it's very, again, there's not a lot of flavour to it. You wouldn't say it's very seafoody, but it's the texture. And if it goes 10 seconds too long in that oil, it's just, it's hard. You know, but I know in Cyprus, I know a few manufacturers over there and hand over fist, they're all just gagging to make halloumi for England. But I also find a lot of, I've always said that I always, I've found a lot of similarities between Cyprus and England anyway. I know that the weather's different, but in terms of everything else, that the people are very similar. Um, it's that, maybe it's that island mentality. It's an island on either side of Europe, and I wonder if that's what makes it quite similar, if that makes sense. No, it does, yeah. I think that's a good point. And I, I, um, I, there are some, yeah, there's, there's some very basic ones, like you know, cars are the same. Do you drive on the same side of the road? There's the Turkish pound Sorry, not to the, the Cypriot. It's the Cypriot pound, isn't it? You know, it's it's one of those things, isn't it? That's uh... again, Cyprus was part of the British Empire essentially for quite a while. You know, so uh, uh, you know, lots of stuff rubs off there as well, doesn't it? Really? Yeah, you see these things of you know colonial relics, and I mean, you go. I, I remember being in Ethiopia and just by chance finding this little cafe, you know, and then they had a very old coffee machine, like a, a brand that doesn't exist anymore now, and. Um, I was talking to this old lady in there and she spoke perfect Italian, you know, that generation, because, you know, it, it was a kind of um, part of Italy's colonial um, efforts, you know, under Mussolini and all that. And uh, she spoke fluent Italian, you know, but uh, her daughter and her daughter's daughter, they, they had no no connection, you know, in terms of language, but she spoke perfect Italian because it was the only way they could, she could get on at that time, you know. So, um, yeah, it was something very unexpected for me to, to, to find there. But then... I could see why um, when you study the history. So can you speak Italian and Greek? Uh, I don't speak Greek. I can get by, you know, basic things and that because I never really lived there for more than a year. And that was in, just before the Olympics. I worked out there for a year. But um, my parents spoke French to each other. Uh, my dad spoke nine languages and my mother five or six, I think. But that was the common language when they So I, 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 I was in a bilingual um, environment of French and then English because at the age of six, I, I, I used to go to French schools. I started going to English-speaking schools because um, we were in a country that didn't have any French schools. Um, so I changed the systems. And um, my first language was Italian because we were in Rome. And I, you know, that was the first language I started speaking as a young child. Um, and then I learned Portuguese and Spanish through living in countries where the languages were spoken. And then English through, through education. I guess I've got five languages, but I'm probably the worst linguist in, in my, my extended family because I never learned the languages in an academic way by living in a country and picking it up. And in the first 10 or 15 years of your life, that's when you should learn a language because it's easy. You pick it up because you you have to learn how to speak the language if you want to have friends, etc. And, uh, and I learned all my languages before I was 15 and then after, you know, even though I was German briefly at school and I just found it too difficult. So if you speak languages... I get really like, I'm jealous of people that can speak loads of different languages. Yeah, I mean, you had to really. I mean, it, 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 it's as simple as that. When you're you know, in a, in a foreign country, if you don't learn the language, you're not going to have any friends, you know? Um, you know, a lot of people speak English and that, but it's uh, it's it's the way to get to get to to, to get by really in, the, in in that. And um, you know, I ended up speaking Portuguese for six years, so I had six years of Portuguese, four in four in Portugal and two in Brazil. So um, by the time I was twelve, I had six years of Portuguese. So it's it's quite a lot, you know. So when when you say your dad spoke nine languages, that's like it's just pretty amazing. Like I struggle with English. Like you know, I'd, every, everyone that I know says to me, "How can you be so bad at English? You've lived here all your life." And I think, as you say, because I lived in a mixed household, as in you know, we, we spoke Cypriot, which is I'm going to say it is a bastard of languages anyway. You know, like so Cypriot is English, Greek, and Turkish all thrown into one pot. So then when you add that to normal English. You know, it just makes it even worse. So, yeah, I butcher English all the time, and I use the wrong words in the wrong places. And so, yeah, I'm definitely jealous like of that. But my dad, you know, being, being you know educated in Greece, he went to a school where German was the second language uh, at that time. So, 
So the, lang- the languages he spoke, where he had no accent, were Greek and German and French. And then all the other languages, you could tell he's a foreigner. Um, but he had to pick them up because he lived in the countries or, or, or so on. But his, his basis were those languages. So, And if, if your first language is Greek, you know, you're not going to meet many people around the world that speak Greek, right? So by definition, you have to speak another language, you know, so at least another one, you know. So. What culture do you feel mostly drawn to? Out of all of the ones that you've been in contact with, yeah, I guess I'm 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 a bit against the grain now, in the sense that you know we live in a in a world where uh, are becoming more nationalistic and that we have culture wars and, and and all that, and I feel pretty comfortable anywhere. You know, I don't. Uh, yeah, obviously there are countries you go to and they're just they're so different. You know, like I mean, I, I travelled a lot in Africa and they're they're extremely. You know, you you know, you're literally looking out the window and you've got lions and. Uh, giraffes but it's like that you know that's you know visibly different you know but um and then there's there's obviously cultures and so on but um i feel pretty comfortable anywhere i go and i and i make a big effort i think it's down to me to make the effort you know i don't think people should speak my languages or whatever so um certainly in europe i'm i'm pretty comfortable everywhere i've I can probably say a few things in most European languages and I know something about the cultures and that. So I think it's about being empathetic, building bridges. And, and I, you know, I recommend that as a general way to be anyway, you know, even if you don't travel at all, you know. So my, my sons always um, take the mickey out of me, you know, because I, I always talk to taxi drivers, you know. There's another thing my dad told me. He said, wherever you go, get to know the taxi drivers because they know everything and they can help you in ways you would never realise. And I said, well, how? He said, well, a taxi driver saved my life. And I said, How? He said, well, I was taking a taxi to go to the airport in Beirut and the, the taxi driver was a Druze, um, which is a, an ethnic group there and so on. And I'd interviewed the leader of the Druze, a very famous uh, politician. So he kind of warmed to me and so on. And just before we got to the airport, the car stopped at the lights and these two guys with machine guns came into the taxi and they they were kidnapping people at the time. And it means well documented and so on. And um, these were actually Palestinian uh, Fatah guys. And, um, they were aligned to the Druze, you know. So the driver just said to them, look, he's a good guy. He's just interviewed this politician, blah, blah, blah. And they just left. But that day, three or four people got kidnapped. And uh, of those, two two were killed eventually. So, you know, that stuck in my mind. You know? So, um, and, you know, when you go to the US or come to London, um, get an Uber or a taxi, whatever, the chances are they'll be immigrants, won't they? So, um, and then some of them have got great stories. I mean, I've had Uber drivers who uh, are nuclear scientists or, you know, um, highly qualified people, but that, that's the way that they have to earn a living now, you know. Um, and similarly, uh, if you go to the US, you know, go to New York, whatever taxi driver you get, you'll suddenly pick up, there's two or three, it might be from Afghanistan. And it's usually because it's the latest wave of refugees or something like that. It's a, it's a natural thing for them to do. And in the US, it's a lot easier because because of the grid system. Even if you don't know the country well, it's quite easy to work out to get to a place, you know. Um, London is much more difficult. And, and I have a lot of sympathy for black cab drivers when they say negative things about Uber because they've had to go through a huge learning curve to get the knowledge and stuff like that. You know, I'm from people that came over here because there was war in Cyprus. And you just mentioned someone in Afghanistan in a taxi in America. I wonder what draws people to go to a country where the country they're going to are the ones that mostly get the blame for the instability in their country. So like my granddad yeah. came to the UK in the 50s. In the 50s, yeah. Cyprus technically was a terrorist state to the UK. And yet they came over to the UK. Same with like people that I know that have come from Afghanistan. And I'll say to him, yeah. well, what's it like in Pakistan, uh, in Afghanistan? He's, oh, the English ruined it. And I'm like, but you're in England. And it's weird how we're drawn. It's like we're all drawn to that mega place, you know. And, and same with Afghanistan and America. Like it is weird how that's where we blame that country well, that generation does yet we take our family there to live yeah it's a it's a it's a byproduct of colonialism isn't it i mean it's it's a it's natural you're more likely to go to 
somewhere you know something about or you can relate to or whatever, you know. And language is an issue as well. I mean, that's one of the great advantages of, of Britain is, is the English language. You know, it gives you a huge advantage in the world. Definitely. No, it's just, again, it's just something that always interests me. But as soon as you mentioned that, I just wanted to sort of bring it up. One thing I wanted to talk about with you is your involvement with tech company Bizimply. Tell us a little bit about that, you know, a little bit about Bizimply for those that don't know. Sure. I mean, I I, I was originally talking to Bizimply about a non-executive um role because uh, i was out in paris i was working mondays to friday in, in paris and coming back home at the weekends for um a co- company called value retail which probably better known as Bista village collection and most most people have heard of Bista village here so i was sorting out a problem in paris that they had which was supposed to take three months but ended up being a year very enjoyable i, I learned so much from that uh, but i've been you know i was sort of planning what to do on, on the way back and i was looking at um I like to have a sort of non-executive role as long as alongside a full-time role. And um, so as I came back, um, uh, Connor Shaw's um, uh, the great CEO there. He, he he said, actually, you know, we looking at your profile and, you know, what you've been doing and that, you know, would you consider something full-time? And I said, I haven't got anything lined up at this moment. I was going to take some time off and then, um, you know, obviously talk to you about the non-executive thing. And, uh that's how it came about. And it's a, it, it's a company where, I mean, I can only really work in places which has the right culture and the right approach to customers, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, especially when you're going to a sector that you're well known in and, and, and you know people, uh, you have to believe and have full confidence in, in the product, the solution and the support. You know, so I'm, uh, that they're the sort of golden things for me. And uh, in, in, to, to a certain extent, you know, from the first day I was there, I, you know, I was literally calling people I knew and, and telling them, you know, this is what I'm doing. And they said, oh, as it happens, you know, and then it, one thing leads to another or they say, uh, oh, you should talk to so-and-so. And so this, this is where the network comes in to a certain extent. And even if it's, you know, a different, um, you know, a lead, if you like, comes in from somewhere else, you know this, I mean, because of what you do that um, – the fact that you understand people's businesses, specifically the area that you're focused in, gives you an edge because um, you talk the language, you talk the you know the right words, and you you can empathise and you understand the issues that people face. Whereas somebody else may be talking to Pappas, let's say, you know, in in um, in the East Riding of Yorkshire, and you talk to them about specifically about things related to their business, but. Another company, you know, who, who talked to them, the previous uh, uh, people that they spoke to just before they got on the phone to, uh, to, to say, George at Papa's would be, an, you know, a carpet uh, warehouse or something like that, you know. So, you know, that, that's where focus and the kind of vertical market approach, I think, wins, you know, every day. And, and customers, potential customers, they can tell that straight away, you know. Like um, I always say, you know, when, if you walk into a room and you have – the customer and the partner, supplier, whatever you want to call them, and you can't tell them apart, that shows that you've got someone who's really addressing the sector and, and, and the business properly. So uh, I've seen that work o- over many, many years, you know, so uh, I think it, it's great. And then and Bizimply was was founded by uh, Jared Ford, who basically had a restaurant. You know, he, he started a restaurant business and he started seeing problems that he wanted to solve. And he had a friend who was a technologist and that was the company was created that way, you know, if you like. So it's it's something um, in the DNA of the company. In fact, we did an internal survey and um, there isn't a single person in the company that actually hasn't worked in hospitality for a period of time. Even even the, the graduate trainees that come in have, have probably got a couple of years' experience working in hospitality, you know, which I think you talk to any of our customers at Bazimply and they'll, they'll have noticed that, you know. Uh, so, so, you know, if a software developer has actually worked in a quick service restaurant, uh, in the kitchen of a fine dining restaurant, it gives them a huge insight because the danger with technology is that you just create technology for technology's sake. And there's a lot of people, a lot of companies that just get caught up in the sort of technology hype curve, you know, and they, they band about technology trends, you know, and hope that that's going to get, you know, the interest of customers in that way. In fact, all they want is something that's going to solve a problem or get a job done, as we like to say, it's, uh, simply, you know. One of the things that I find with software is that, especially online, you know, SaaS software, is that people just think, oh, it's only £10 a month, I'll grab that. Oh, it's only £50 a month, I'll have that. Or I've got, you know, for Ceres, we've got online software, some of it costs £10 a month, some of it costs 250 a month but you're right you can just get software for the sake of getting software you know i i was chatting to a friend of mine the other day who doesn't like any of this software he's got seven outlets in our industry 
and does all of his staffing with a spreadsheet. All his rotors spreadsheet spends hours and hours and hours. He said it's a two day thing. And you think that, that's where software would really be handy for him. We should be able to show, and we do, that our software pays for itself in X amount of days, really, because once we know they're doing things like that, you know, time is money, whichever way you look at it. And then, you know, we're completely, what we do is completely focused on people. So making, managing people more efficient and also controlling your labor costs. As you know, labor is is the one variable, if you like, which you can control to a certain extent, you know, like if, um, if the price of um, fish goes up, there's nothing you can do about it. You know, it's it's a supply and demand thing, right? If if cod goes up because of stocks are low or whatever, uh, what, what can you do about it? You have no control over it. But you can you can work out that you've got two people too many on a shift, and at the end of the month, that's um, straight into your bottom line if you if you're managing your business efficiently. It's as simple as that. I guess something like Bizimply, you, you'd see it ahead of you. You'd see it that well, I've got too many people there. One thing that I quite like about Bizimply, I had a quick look myself, is, is that it's all the HR stuff as well. That's going to be a real big issue moving forward, in my view. I think a lot of food businesses, because they focus, well, hospitality businesses, because they focus so much on the hospitality side, they forget or at least can't manage the HR side. Whereas I think software like Bizimply covers all of that. And I think that's pretty impressive, in my view. Yeah, I mean, I, w- I was talking to somebody the other day, and you should have seen their kitchen. It's the most modern, high-tech kitchen I've ever seen. You name a gadget, they had it in there. The quality of the ovens, everything like that, you know. And then uh, I, I was talking to the chef because I knew him and then talked to various other people. And then I was talking to the person who was responsible for HR by default, really. And we were talking about somebody and, and she said, give me a minute. And then she went to this massive cabinet and started pulling out these files. And I'm going, you should have nothing, no paper. There's no excuse. You don't have to use it simply, but God's sake, you know. You know, how, that alone was like 10 minutes to find the file, you know, and then you just have to work it out. You know, her salary was probably X and 10 minutes wasted, you know, should have just clicked and brought up somebody's details, you know, their, uh, whether they'd been trained to the right level of health and safety, you know, but it, it's, that, that should be at a touch of a button. There's no, no, no excuse for that, really. You know? And if you integrate everything, it just makes your your operation. And uh, so that's one thing. And the other thing is, is to recognize what you're good at and to be prepared to integrate with best in class. You know, we have something called the golden tech stack, you know, which, you know, we try and recommend to customers, you know, because we can see who the good guys are, what's, what's working, the, the people that are, are doing a good job. And uh, if we're asked, we'll, we'll always, you know, recommend. So we work very closely with other companies and uh, from integrating into them, you know, with APIs to often getting involved in the same projects and that. And uh, um, I remember a guy you may have actually, you should actually um, interview maybe if you haven't, I'll, I'll introduce you a guy called uh, Theodore Kiriaku. So he's, he started the real Greek and um, before that live bait. But I remember when he was at the Greek Larder, he was actually employing software developers to try and make. You know, I'm thinking you're a restaurateur. Why are you developing? You know, like, and he said, I've got to get this working with this, and you know, and um, it was just bizarre, you know. And um, I'm hoping he doesn't mind me saying this, but he's he hasn't got a lot of hair, Theodore. But he he was literally pulling his hair out. I mean, what little hair he had left, you know. And he's an amazing chef, and he's got a great new business now in um, uh, in East End, you know, which is uh, in St Catherine's Dock. Kind of, uh, it's like a little. If you go there, it'll remind you of home. It's like it's like being on a Greek island, if you like, but it's it's a bit more international on that. Great wine a lot of seafood and, and all that so it's a, sh- it, it's a shame that um it didn't work out for whatever reason where he was at the greek ladder because i really like that i i thought i used to go there all the time and the food was always good yeah it's, it was ahead of its it was ahead of its time there because now that area's changed there's you know google have gone in there and and the, there's a lot more restaurants so it's become a one of london's hubs now there's 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 maybe 20 really good restaurants around there but he was like the first yeah, I guess I guess when I went, there was just the Guardian across the road. They're all vegans, aren't they? So. I don't know about that. I know if you, um, I should introduce you to Bob Granlese, who's the uh, editor of the food uh, uh, Saturday Foods uh, magazine and section in the, in the in the main newspaper. Who's uh, I'd say one of the best food editors around. Um, uh, he's um, definitely not a vegan. And uh, Alan Jenkins, who does the same or, uh, for the Guardian, uh, the Observer Food Monthly, who are both in that building, um, he's another great um, forchetta, as they say in Italy, fork. You know, he loves his food and um, he's certainly not a, a vegan, to my knowledge anyway. But um, uh, last time I was with him, we were definitely eating meat. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think, I think you get all sorts at the Guardian, you know, though. 
what do you think sort of restaurants are going to have to sort of focus on post COVID? It's been a tricky time for them. If they've made it through, well done to them, nailed it. What what do you think are the biggest challenges moving forward? I think from my view, I think one of the biggest issues that are still unresolved, um, and I wonder how long it will take, is is the rent issues. I think you know the, the you know rent has been piling up and piling up, and no one has sort of said what's going to happen there. And I do wonder if the government's just waiting for the crisis to be behind us, I wonder. It's a good, really good question. I think people ask me about, you know, what's going on in the restaurant sector and so on. And, and the, the reality is that every restaurant or restaurant group is different and they have different variables, you know, and the variables are location, landlords, uh, what their offer is, you know, and by that I mean, you know, did they have a takeaway element in their business before? And of course, very important is their balance sheet. What was their balance sheet like before? You know, some of them had terrible balance sheets. Some of them were printing money, you know. And, you know, what you're touching on really is is the landlord issue. And it really depends on the relationships. I mean, you've got, it was in the news recently that, um, you know, Grosvenor are in fact investing in a JKS restaurant. That shows you some a different business models emerging. So you know, I hear different stories. I, you know, I, I know businesses that have had to close because the landlord has been intransigent. But then again, the landlord is a business. It's, you know, they have to, they can't just, you know, they're always, they can't be painted as the bad guys and so on. So it, it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's a very good question, but I think it's varies from restaurant and restaurant group. You know, some of them have great relationships and they've managed to work it through. And obviously the government is involved to a certain extent um, and has, has provided significant, uh, I, know, I know some people complain that you know, it's never enough and so on, but when you see what's happened, I, I, I find it, um, it's beyond what I expected. I don't know about you, but I, I was, I was very, very, and, and, and it was relatively quick as well. You know, uh, yeah, you can point to other countries where maybe they've done a bit better for hospitality, like France, and in other areas they haven't, you know. So I, th- I think what it's done for most businesses, it's given them time to reassess and to decide and maybe right size, if that's the right expression, their business, so that they, some of them were, were over-expanding t- maybe too quickly so it's you know it's 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 uh, you know but then there's huge opportunities now i mean look at the number of new openings that are going on now and of course there's a lot of bargains available i mean i know one significant restaurant group that basically are, are getting calls on by the minute basically of, of offers you know to to take a site you know with um rent free for three years and sign now pay later you know all sorts of stuff right so yeah unfortunately a lot of businesses because they had specific conditions, the location, the landlord, the offer have had to close. We've lost some really good restaurants in terms of, I'm talking about restaurants that, you know, maybe the business wasn't uh, A1, but they were producing great food or great service. And, that, and that's very, very sad because jobs have been lost as well. But at the same time now, there's a shortage of people. That's another big thing that I think people are waking up to. You know, there's a lot of people who have decided to spend their their lockdowns outside the country and not coming back, you know, who are Brits or even uh, Europeans who've just said, well, I'm, I'm not going back. I'm going to stay now. And uh, others have got out of the sector because they've got used to a different um, you know, because working hospitality is very, very hard. Uh, anybody who thinks it's, you know, easy, um, they have no idea. I mean, it's, it's so not everybody can do it. It's very hard work. And, you know, if, if you're sitting around at home for months on end, it gives you time to think, well, is that what I want to do? And so we have to work doubly hard. I mean, I, uh, Fred Syriax is a good friend of mine and he's been doing these campaigns for years to, get people into hospitality, young people and all that. You almost have to start that all over again. You know, it's um, it, it's a big sector. It's still there. The demand is there. The pent-up demand is there. We have something like 172 billion of unspent money. And by that, I mean money that would have been spent on season tickets to get into London or to wherever you commute to, on eating out and all that stuff. A lot of that is going to be spent. And that's why probably yesterday the Bank of England said the forecast for GDP has gone amazing, seven and a half, seven and a half. That's incredible. So this, you know, um, batten down the hatches because um, I, I, I see a, a very, very huge demand, uh, pent up demand for for, for the sector. Um, so now, now look at look at the look at the pay that people are having to offer now because it's not just good people; it's people full stop. There's an amazing shortage. I mean, you know, it's um, 
So I think there's there's lots of challenges ahead, but huge opportunities. Do you see some of the chains that before that were over leveraged? Is that going to change? Do you think? Do you think some people are going to say, you know what, I'm going to stick to one good restaurant, which is my bread and butter. Does I do a lot of great money out of it? Or do you still see that people sort of doing more restaurants? Because I think I do think COVID has had a bit of a clearing of those. Yeah, I mean, you know, people talk about corrections and they would have happened anyway and maybe it's accelerated. I mean, there's two trends that I think have been accelerated. One is the general digital transformation of biz- all businesses, so uh, of which, you know, the um, hospitality sector is one. Um, and I see um, a kind of reappraisal of working workflows and working patterns and stuff like that people i think the people there'll be much more focus on being efficient so maybe with less people and to, to and this is where you know obviously i'm i work in technology i'm bound to say that but that, that this is where technology can be an enabler you know to help help that you know to help people do their jobs better you know and provide better service and and, and so on and uh, and keep tabs on on profitability which is at the end of the day in the long run, um, you know that's that, that's where you know restaurants have to to aspire to. Of course, there there's plenty of investment going in. There's there's uh, I, I met a consultant the other day and he showed me a list of clients that are looking for prime sites in central London. You know, in Covent Garden, Soho, it was it was staggering. Totally new entrance into the market. You know, so there's 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 um, you know um, people who want to invest in Britain. Or want to start restaurants here? It's as you said earlier. It's 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 a you know if you're going to have a sort of global, you build a global brand. You know you want a London restaurant, right? So there, there's a lot of um, UAE and Saudi Arabian based groups who are, are actually opening up as we speak. They're opening uh, high end restaurants in in Mayfair and places like that. There's uh, Indian you know um, restaurateurs, you know, and they're still paying serious rents in places like Mayfair. I can tell you, you know, there's um, um, so it's it's you know. Um, you know, but at the same time, then you know there may be a um, sort of three or four branches of a QSR restaurant in a bit of a you know an area that's no longer viable that will have to close. You know, um, and that's 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 the nature of the beast. But um, uh, I've got to say, I'm very optimistic about the future. Uh, but without you, you know, you have to recognise that there's been some some casualties, unfortunately. I do remember even, and I'll let you go shortly because I know you're a busy guy, but I remember pre-COVID, um, I remember Sat Baines doing an article somewhere and he says, there isn't a chef shortage. He said, there's an oversupply of restaurants. And that made me really think like, because the out of home food market now is so saturated and everyone's fighting for the talent. And and I think that's that's going to be a problem. It's always going to be a problem, especially now with um, Brexit and less people being allowed to come into the UK. Um, that's not even taken aside. It's just the fact that for the next few years, there will be less people coming into the UK um, until they can figure out all of the visas and everything. So, uh, and, and also, I think the government would want to see wages rise slightly with less immigration. I think that's by design. So I do think that the talent that's going to be out there is going to cost more. Absolutely. Spot on. And uh, there's... There's already evidence there that you can see, you know, that restaurants are having to pay more, you know, for the same staff that they had, the same quality of staff that they had before because of uh, because of that. I mean, um, but there's a lot of very good indicators. I mean, I was talking to an operator the other day, and they've they've not been able to open their West End and City branches, but they have one in in uh, Canary Wharf, which has. Um, and since April the 12th, they've been doing bigger numbers without being open indoors, like for like, doing 20 or 30% more with just with the outdoors or you know, they've put extra tables out and, uh, and they're rammed and they're getting a new new type of customer. A lot of them aren't people that work in uh, Canary Wharf because less people are going into the office, but they're getting residential people, people who are coming from a mile or two down the road who are just desperate to go and have a nice meal, someone cook for them in, in a modern environment, obviously Canary Wharf, and they're sitting outside and if the weather's good, it's a lovely time, you know. So, like everything, there's winners and losers, unfortunately, you know. And um, uh, don't get me wrong, some people have done really well out of um, the lockdowns and COVID and everything like that. So, it's uh, it's not all doom and gloom. And um, But I, I, I'm an optimist about the future and I, and I, uh, I see the signs, you know, that, that you know, um, 
Always remembering the casualties, of course. Well, Dino, thank you for your time today. Um, where can people follow you? Twitter and Instagram? Yeah, I'm uh, on Twitter. Uh, I was I was an early adopter on Twitter and LinkedIn and uh, other uh, platforms. So um, yeah, on LinkedIn, Dino Ioannidis, uh, you'll find me. Um, I'm Gastro One on link on uh, on Twitter. I think I'm uh, Gastro One or Dino Ioannidis on Instagram, um, which I find more and more uh, interesting. I'm even on Clubhouse. Now, did I? I sent you an invite, but you rejected it. No, I didn't reject it. I joined it. But it was just like <laughs> there was just again. It's just another social platform to to not manage because I can barely manage all the others. Yeah, but Clubhouse is quite interesting. I think it's got legs. It's um, it's something completely different. If you've got half an hour, just go in and, and join a what, group or just listen. That, just what's um, half an hour? Well, no, no. If you you could be you could be brushing your teeth, but I'm just saying that um, there's some really. It, it's a bit like Reddit in a way. It's some very niche groups. Yeah. You know, you might find you know Coventry City supporting Greek Cypriots who like fish and chips, right? Wow. It may be a group like that. You know? I wouldn't want to go to that group, man. Like, seriously, <laughs> like, no, no, I know. Yeah. I was trying to think of a group that. You know, niche. I know what you mean. I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no. I mean, there's some really interesting ones, you know, around acting, around politics, around uh, food, you know, and there's some, some, and the thing is, is there's some, you know, you, you, you're in a group and suddenly there's someone speaking and bloody hell, he goes, wow, it's him, mm. you know, it's, 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 um, it's kind of at a stage where it's at the interesting, interesting stage. I know it's by invite only, but you know, I, I you know, I, I invite as many people as I can. And I think every now and then they send me three invites. I invite people, and and it's you know, eventually it's going to open up. But it's um, it's it's definitely um, and it's audio, so you can you can you, you can listen to it in your car. You can you know, if you're driving, you want an, an alternative to music or podcasts or talking to somebody. So um, I'm not a shareholder, by the way. So um, it, I'm just. Um, it, I think it's Mark Andreessen who set it up, isn't it? I think, isn't it? He's he's one of the investors, yeah, and um, in, in fact, when you join, I think you automatically have them to follow. The, the, the founders just appear as followers, you know, so you can you can talk to them. And if and, there's a clubhouse for Sovlagi, I'm there. Um, that's that's my thing. There's bound to be. There's bound to be. I mean, I know there's one. There's a very famous um, uh, guy. Uh, he's one of the greatest palettes in the world, a guy called Vedat Amilor, who's actually based in Atlanta, Georgia, but he's a Turkish academic and he's got a column. Um, and he, unfortunately, it's in Turkish, but it's uh, it's, a, it's a very, I know people on that group and they tell me what they talk about. It's fascinating. And uh, they're talking um, mainly about kebabs, basically. Nice. Um, and there's, there's Greeks on there. There's, you know, so they've gone, you know, and people who may have political differences or, or historic, you know, um, uh, issues. They're all on there, you know. Um, Iranians, Iranians and uh, Turks. And, you, Iranians um, love their food, man. They, they yeah, oh, they're yeah, proper yeah. food. Is, yeah. yeah, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. So, so, uh, so Dino, people can follow you on Twitter, Instagram. They can follow you on LinkedIn, and also if they want any, um, any to get in touch with you regarding HR or rotors, then they can get you at Bizimply. Yeah, D Journeyless. So it's the um, my surname J O A W N I D E S at thezimply dot com, um, and they can they can contact me uh, anytime and uh, on any uh, of these uh, social media platforms and that. And I'll definitely try and get back to them. And um, always happy to recommend restaurants to anybody or ingredients or anything like that. I, I really enjoy that when people reach out. Um, uh, I like to support you know artisans especially who work night and day to produce amazing food we've got lots of them here in this country and um uh they are uh they're the future you know and um uh if we can support them then uh, and i'll send you the name of the guy who's making uh halloumi in north awesome. london awesome i bet it's the same guy but still nonetheless yeah. i'd love halloumi it's my it's my yeah. go-to cheese i'm not very adventurous you see <laughs> so, unless i like comte comte is nice yeah, fantastic yeah. cheese. Yeah, it's one of the great cheeses. Yeah. yeah. So, Dino, thank you very much for your time, and hopefully, we can get you on again in the future. Thank you, sir. Thank you for inviting me. Talk soon. It's been a pleasure. Same. Likewise. Talk soon, mate. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Ceres Podcast. This was brought to you by Ceres Pure Food Innovation and your host, the founder and managing director, Stelios. 
This episode wouldn't have been possible without our show supporters, Giovanna Grossi and Amanda Affia of Source Intelligence Mystery Guest Audit, well known for their commitment to the hospitality sector and support those working in it. Their business offers a range of bespoke training programs tailored to your operations, individual training needs, and includes a number of options to suit the size and style of your operation. Support us by supporting our sponsors.